Arc 5, Stars That Engrave History Chapter 22, A Casual Response Could this be called aerial warfare? Reinhardt had leapt towards Sirius, knocking his opponent from the tower and sending her flying through the sky. Sirius, ha ha ha! Ah, how impressive you are! As the heroic figure flew toward her, she raised her voice, ecstatic, and waved her arms about. Accompanying that motion was the piercing whine of her chain unraveling from her wrist. That fully extended chain could now be used as a whip, although its merit as a weapon was based more in intimidating appearance and violence sound than convenience. Someone who chose to wield such a weapon was clearly out of touch with common sense. That iron snake had undoubtedly tasted the blood of more than just a few people, and, at this moment, was partaking in a routine hunt, attempting to crush its prey with its iron jaws, the whistling wind it created resembling applause. But even that blunt snake, who could approach the speed of sound, was clueless. In this world, there existed a human existence that exists in the same sense as that of Sirius that departed from its usual course. Reinhardt, a chain, how troublesome. Hearing the sound of the chain entering the fight, the sword saint frowned and gave a troubled mutter. In the midst of such an intense battle, he seemed to be giving the slight grievance that better suited the atmosphere of a brief break between classes. Sirius, ha ha ha. Sirius, on the verge of panting, revealed her passionate smile to the spectators. Surely, that was inevitable. However, the reasoning behind Sirius's delight was mysterious. Whether it was because of desperation, or whether she was genuinely happy, one face was clear to all the spectators. This was a situation that only Sirius would have laughed in. Reinhardt. Sirius flew upwards, and Reinhardt pursued her from below. With Reinhardt as her target, Sirius delivered a quick, precise blow. Even facing that oncoming chain, Reinhardt didn't reach for the sword hanging at his waist. If his words from long before were true, it wasn't that he didn't intend to draw his sword, it was that he couldn't. Reinhardt's legendary sword would only allow itself to face worthy opponents. In that case, he was condemned to be unarmed while fighting that horrible freak. Even Reinhardt, who Subaru had the utmost trust in, would have to undergo a bitter struggle perhaps he would even fail to live up to Subaru's expectation, in a show of human weakness. If so, then that trust would soon be broken. Aiming her second strike at Reinhardt's, a high-pitched voice spoke up. Shockwaves and sparks danced at the scene. To Subaru and the other spectators, lightning seemed to flash through the sky. The ability to accomplish that kind of witchcraft was precisely the proof that Reinhardt transcended the boundaries of human skill. Reinhardt met the chain head-on, lifting a slender leg to defend against it. That attack was so surprising that it would have elicited a laugh. After that impact, Reinhardt turned attention to wrapping his foot with the chain, moving it to suit his own will. The movement itself was nothing too special. Reinhardt had met the approaching chain with his right leg and wounded around his foot in a makeshift weapon, using it to open an immediate follow-up. In only a moment, he'd easily alternated between offensive and defensive. Needless to say, not everyone could keep up with the fight. Only the handful of people with combat training could follow those rapid, continuous attacks. In that moment of understanding, there was an impulse to laugh. Subaru gave a long sigh and relaxed his shoulders. Fortunately, Reinhardt was a comrade, so those thoughts were unnecessary. If he were the enemy, then Subaru's shoulders, knees, and bladder would have all given out. Sirius, ha ha, ha ha ha. Ha ha ha, ha 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 ha. Sirius laughed loudly, her right arm spinning wildly like a tornado. Since her left arm had been captured by Reinhardt, she could only resort to using the right one. However, although the whistling snake tore through the sky, flying from every direction, it was blocked by the chain on Reinhardt's right foot, creating a high-pitched whine and a shower of sparks. Every spark dancing in the blue sky was accompanied by a metallic instrument whose sound permeated the square in a whirling performance of red and yellow. A strike, another blow, but during that period, Reinhardt had further closed the distance between himself and Sirius. Soon, after exchanging an array of blows, he'd reached her. Sirius, how unexpected. You've actually reached this point. Amazing. Reinhardt, you're very adept. I find it a shame that you've committed yourself to evil. In those moments, the two exchanged words the way they did attacks. Reinhardt quickly pulls back his right leg and thrusts his left hand with aligned fingers. Sirius greeted it with a powerful swing of her arm, the undulating chain diving at Reinhardt with exposed fangs. Although the chain was made of steel, Reinhardt had used his own hand as a blade and cleaved it in two. In the past, Subaru had witnessed the perfect splitting of disposable wooden chopsticks a party trick. If Reinhardt were to partake in those performances, he could split a steel blade like paper. He was the very portrait of beautiful swordplay. The severed portion of the chain was propelled by the attack's momentum into the clock tower. The violent collision shattering one of the building's walls. 
The sight of smoke and the rubble crashing into the square shook Subaru out of his trance. He'd been completely fascinated. Reinhardt and Sirius's fight, no, Reinhardt's fight, had entranced him. Whether envy or fear caused fascination was another matter entirely. Subaru, leaving her to Reinhardt is fine. Then, I... He couldn't continue to dawdle here, blindly ogling the fight and waiting for an outcome. Subaru squeezed through a gap in the crowd, running to the opening of the tower. Luzbel, who had been scheduled to be part of Sirius's speech, had probably been abandoned in the clock tower when he responded to Reinhardt's inability to withdraw. Saving him would ease Subaru's worries. Just in case, so that if Sirius got away from Reinhardt, Luzbel's safety would be guaranteed. Subaru climbed anxiously up the spiral staircase, again tasting that dark, damp air. The tower was much brighter than it had been 15 minutes ago, thanks to the light flooding in from the walls that had been broken by Sirius's chain. After safely ascending the spiral staircase, Subaru found the bound Luzbel on the top floor. He'd been left face down on the ground, where his tears had pulled into a puddle. The child's sobs touched Subaru deeply. Subaru, Luzbel. You're safe now, don't worry. Subaru tenderly took the chained Luzbel into his arms. He ignored the warm torrent of tears as he returned Luzbel's desperate, terrified gaze with his own reassuring one. Luzbel, MMM. Subaru, it's alright, I'm on your side. And as for that monster, a reliable hero is fighting her right now. So, let's take this time to get you out of here. Luzbel, MMM. Subaru spoke with the utmost sincerity. Gradually, the struggling Luzbel's body lost its strength, and he faced Subaru with a tearful but clear expression. After Subaru nodded in response to that inquiring gaze, Luzbel began sobbing anew, for a different reason than before. Subaru, wait a second. Let me get this off of you. After gently touching crying boy's head, Subaru started cautiously working on the chain. From the shoulders to ankles, the chain was wound tightly, and he was also gagged with it. Subaru took care to avoid hurting the child as he unraveled it. Subaru, well, I got it off. Can you stand up? If not, I can carry you. Luzbel, d don't worry, it's, thank you, hook. Luzbel rose unsteadily to his feet, shaking his stiff legs, offering his gratitude. Although his face was stained with tears, he was still a strong child. Subaru patted his head again. Then, as he pondered the intense battle taking place near the tower. Subaru, staying here might actually be safer, but we should probably get out just in case. Can you walk? Are you hurt anywhere? Luzbel, my right hand, just a little bit. Luzbel frowned and obediently presented his wound to Subaru. On his outstretched right hand was a sharp laceration that had clearly been made by a snake-like weapon. Seeing the blood oozing from the wound, Subaru contorted his face in discomfort. Subaru, bastard, tying up such a small child, and even doing this to him. Luzbel, no no. This just suddenly, suddenly hurting when I was tied up. Subaru, suddenly? While he had been tied up, Subaru registered distractedly. At least, Subaru shouldn't have hurt him in the process of unraveling the chain. His movements had been cautious, and if Luzbel had suffered so serious an injury, Subaru would have noticed. A terrible, ominous apprehension rose in Subaru's heart. Subaru, at any rate, we can't stay here. Let's go. Subaru took Luzbel's uninjured left hand and led him to the bottom of the spiral staircase, to the exit of the tower. When Subaru returned to the square, he heard. Crowd, kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. The mob had plunged into a frenzy, eagerly awaiting the execution of that captured freak, calling for vindication. Eyes filled with bloodlust, mouths twisted in snarls, howling for murder. Endless abhorrence of evil. Incredulous aversion to the unnatural. Wanting to be rid of the presence of an enemy who wasn't physiologically acceptable. This emotion was one of murderous intent. And what was this called? This was known as wrath. Crowd, kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. A crowd of complete strangers stood side by side as comrades, moving toward the same goal. Crowd, kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Their very hearts united in that moment, facing the spirits of good and evil. Crowd, kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Choosing to be united, pushing that limit, that was. Crowd, kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Serious, joining feelings into one, this is surely love, correct? Well, there is no doubt that this is a scene only love could achieve, don't you agree? Rather than devising a scheme, Sirius murmured in her usual voice. 
Sirius had been pressed to the side of the tower by the hero. The surrounding crowd eagerly cheered for the death of the unnatural person, and knowing that their sword saint had the power to kill the abomination. The desperate Sirius seemed to have lost even the chain has on her left hand. If both hands were unarmed, she had no way to defend against Reinhardt's knife-like hand. This was clearly a dead end however, Sirius wore her usual placid smile. Reinhardt, are there any last words you want to say? Sirius, thank you. Then, allow me to offer you in peace advice. The other archbishops may not be as docile as me, so if you want to ask their last words, you might suffer for it. Reinhardt, I will keep that in mind. In the face of Reinhardt's warm kindness, Sirius spoke a calm statement. Reinhardt nodded in compliance and stepped forward, ready to execute her with the blade that was his hand. Crowd, kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. As the voice of the crowd grew in intensity, Sirius's fate had been sealed. This was obvious, so why? Standing at the entrance of the broken tower, Subaru felt a throbbing chill threatening to break his heart. Why? What did that mean? He desperately wanted to speak, but his mouth couldn't move. Once he began to speak, Subaru knew what he would say. Subaru certainly would join the loud cries of kill her. Serious, we know each other. Mutual humility. Mutual recognition. We forgive each other. That's exactly the correct form that love should take. Ignoring the subdued Subaru, Sirius continued to preach her rhetoric. At first glance, she seemed to make sense, but taking into account that Sirius was saying so, that proposition, and the atmosphere itself turned unpleasant. Reinhardt Reinhardt seemed to have made the same judgment as Subaru. There was no longer any meaning in letting Sirius speak, so Reinhardt moved forward. However, just before Reinhardt reached her, Sirius smiled and held her arms into the air. Immediately, accompanied by a crackling sound, chains were ejected from the cuffs of her coat. Those chains were fired through her sleeves, and then wrapped around the tower as Sirius began to fly once more. She intended to escape, but just before she could, Reinhardt stomped on the ground. Shock waves spread upward, like an explosion. His hand struck at her in a smooth, upward motion. In that moment, Sirius's life would end. Crowd, kill her. Kill her. Kill her. Kill her. And that result will be prompted by the crowd's cry. Subaru's heart spiked with fear. Driven by a sudden impulse. Subaru, Reinhard. He yelled the hero's name, but falling under the sway of the crowd. Subaru, kill her. Reinhard slashed. A clean line swept neatly from Sirius's left shoulder to her right flank. That exquisite cut was so sharp that there was a delay of several seconds before Sirius's body could react. Finally, the blood in her body noticed the wound, and her body collapsed as blood began to spray. Sirius. Ah, this gentle world. Her internal organs spilling out, Sirius's body was cleft in half. Her upper body continued soaring upward, pouring blood and intestines through the air, while her lower body, left in place, became a fountain, sprinkling blood through the square. This was hell come to earth. No one could bear to look straight at that horror. However, no one looked away. No one could look away. Reinhardt, it can't be. After landing, Reinhardt uttered a stunned mutter. Subaru saw that his blue eyes were shaking with grief, a desperate shadow enveloping his fair, handsome face. And then Subaru could see no more. Subaru. Subaru and the rest of the crowd lay scattered in the square that had turned into a pool of blood. From their left shoulders to their right sides, everyone had been clearly bisected. Subaru. Blood and viscera spilling out, Subaru's consciousness didn't have time to understand what was happening before he was pulled into the embrace of death. Just before that happened, he felt something else. A boy's left hand, holding on to his own, whose owner had also been cleaved enough, squeezed tightly, looking to Subaru for salvation. He seemed to have felt that somewhere before. Liliana, after the song ends and they chat again, shouldn't we prepare food and drinks for them? Indulging in sweet snacks will certainly create a mood that will close the distance between them, don't you think so? Subaru, guck. Beatrice, ow. Ow, that hurts. It hurts in fact, Subaru. Blinking rapidly, Subaru was surprised by what he just heard. The sudden switch in consciousness had him clinging to Beatrice's hand with the same vice grip that he'd been making before his return by death. Beatrice tearfully kicked Subaru's leg after suffering from that sudden atrocity, who recoiled in pain and loosened his grip on her hand. Liliana, WWW why did you do that? Why would you attack Beatrice Sama's lovely hands so suddenly? You're going to ruin them, but it's okay I. I'll kiss them and make it better for you, ha ha ha. 
Beatrice, it's all right, I suppose. That's quite gross, in fact. Beatrice flushed with panic as Liliana grabbed her hand. She ducked behind Subaru. Even if he had injured her hand, her trust in her partner had not diminished. Amelia, Subaru, are you all right? Just now, you suddenly turned pale. Subaru, e Amelia Tan. A concerned Amelia had joined his side, reaching a hand to his forehead. Subaru saw himself reflected in her amethyst eyes and breathed a sigh. He'd come back. He patted his shoulders and chest, which had been nearly bisected. His abdomen was cut, and his head had been smashed. Although Subaru was confident in his experience with deaths, this had been his first real beheading. Taking precedence over pain was a sense of astonishment and loss, the knowledge of his death tugging at Subaru's spirit. This was a death that Subaru, who was commonly subjected to them, could accept. Subaru, why, can't I find a simple conclusion? Once again catching up with the memories he'd inherited memory, this death taught him the reality of Sirius's power. Although he hadn't registered much pain, the sense of loss and shock hit Subaru one after the other. His partial understanding of the phenomenon grew. That is, this time, the cause of death. Subaru, disgusting. Needless to say, he had long understood. Subaru was beheaded and killed this time exactly the same way that Sirius was. In other words, to put it bluntly, Subaru went through the same deathmatch as Sirius. Looking back 30 minutes before the first reincarnation, Subaru only saw Luzbel's death in joy, and then he died. The previously unknown cause of death had now been identified. Sirius could transfer deaths if anyone died in her vicinity. Not just brainwashing with emotional changes. Even changes that occurred in the body could be shared. It wasn't merely brainwashing, but body washing. Or could it be called soul washing? In other words, killing her meant killing all of the people in that square. Subaru, what to do? Defeating Sirius using brute force could be achieved by calling Reinhardt. Only, that would come at the price of the life of everyone in that square. In that case, the result would be no different from Sirius's intended atrocities. Summoning Reinhardt was nothing more than a concise and easy-to-understand solution at first glance, but it was, in actuality, the wrong answer. In this case, what could he do? Subaru, call Reinhardt and tell him to take her alive. That was unlikely, but perhaps not impossible. Since Reinhardt was capable of killing Sirius, he should also be capable of detaining her. The problem was that if she were caught alive, there would be no way to end her spiritual control. Subaru had come in contact with Sirius and Luzbel, and had gone mad and died. If that insidious, insane infection were to be repeated, then capturing Sirius would be fruitless. If she were killed, the everyone would be buried with her. If she were caught, there was a possibility that she'd spread her contagion. Just existing made her a threat to others, she was this kind of bomb-like existence. She truly deserved her title of Sin Archbishop. Subaru, what else? Unable to find a breakthrough, Subaru found himself in a dilemma. If Reinhardt were called, he would surely be able to kill or restrain Sirius. Was that okay, ignoring the possibility of falling into madness? Subaru. Time was passing even as Subaru pondered. Seeing the silent Subaru, those around him all appeared uneasy. Whether to keep them from worrying or to keep them in the dark, Subaru had to offset that impression. He hurriedly changed the expression on his face and announced. Subaru, ah, right. That is, yes, I suddenly felt like I'd puke up the grilled meat from this morning. My chest was a bit uncomfortable. Liliana, ah, I see, I see. I too often feel nauseous, which is accompanied by a lot of gas. Subaru, stop right there. No matter how you act, you're still a girl. Subaru interrupted Liliana's jokes with a smile and turned towards Amelia. Seeing that, Amelia lowered her gaze. Amelia, I'll believe Subaru since he says so, but this is a special case, okay? Subaru, mm, thanks, then, I'll go buy desserts, as Liliana suggested. Amelia Tan, please continue to enjoy the song. Thanks to Amelia's kindness, Subaru was able to make an announcement after his wavering. Then, holding Beatrice's hand again. Subaru, Biko. Come shopping with me. Let's take a walk and banter like we always do. Beatrice, what are you suddenly mm? I understand, in fact. Beatrice cast aside her usual attitude when she saw Subaru's face. To put it more appropriately, she accepted his offer after noticing his pleading expression. Subaru took a confused Beatrice's hand and ran from the park for the fourth time. This time, rather than leaving Beatrice behind, he'd bring his reliable partner with him. Even though he had yet to reach any kind of breakthrough. Priscilla, hum. 
Staring at the retreating figures of Subaru and Beatrice, the red-clad woman watched the duo with a thoughtful expression. Chapter 23, Disrupted Situation Beatrice, so? Tell me what happened, in fact. Having left the park, Beatrice determined that they'd left Amelia's line of sight, and slowed her steps. Although she'd slowed to talk, Subaru grabbed her arm and led her forward. Beatrice, Subaru? Subaru, sorry. We have to talk where no one else is around. There are many things that I want to discuss thoroughly, but we don't have enough time. In fact, we have less than 15 minutes. Beatrice. I understand, I suppose. Explain while we walk, in fact. Beatrice marched along obediently as Subaru turned his face away, trying to hide his anxiety. The presence of his understanding partner lightened Subaru's heart, and he carefully sorted through the thoughts swimming in his mind as he tried to relay them to Beatrice. Subaru, the witch cult will attack the square that we're heading to, and we have to stop their wickedness. Beatrice, witch cult, hook. Beatrice's breath caught, and she urged Subaru to continue. What troubled him were the rules and penalties for giving out information learned through return by death. Even if he'd been able to safely relay tidbits to Larkins, there was no certainty that he could do so with Beatrice. That was the nature of the devil of shadows who bound him. The handicap that prevented return by death from showing giving out information only judged the punishment after that had already happened. If that weren't the case, Amelia's heart wouldn't have been crushed when she'd learned the secret. This was the only explanation he could think of. So Subaru paid careful attention to what he told Beatrice. Those devil's hands, when reaching for Subaru, were terrifying but not unbearable. However, if they reached Amelia or Beatrice, Subaru would be crippled by his guilt. It could be forgiving to Subaru, but it was merciless to others. Beatrice, as usual, you can't say anything, I suppose? Subaru, sorry. I'm so unreasonable. Beatrice, fine, in fact. I'll believe it without any basis, I suppose. They're Subaru's words, so Betty will believe them, in fact. Beatrice took the useless Subaru's hand with her own. The warmth in the palm of her hand gave him the strength to speak his next words. Serious wrath could connect senses and brainwash souls, and, taking into account the difficulty of communication, Beatrice's perception of danger would be skewed. Subaru, first of all, the sin archbishop of the witch cult who will appear as wrath, who is, a, uh, a pervert. Beatrice, if that's the information that needs to be conveyed then Betty thinks that Subaru is having bad thoughts, I suppose. Subaru, anyway, there's something very important that we'll have to deal with. Her abilities, she can control emotions, or is it sharing senses between people? Beatrice, controlling emotions and sharing senses? Beatrice lifted her head. She was unable to concretely picture it. Of course, Subaru also could not clearly understand the effect of that power. Subaru, explaining is a little difficult, if wrath is overjoyed, then no matter how angry I am, I'll also feel happy. Beatrice. I don't really underhand how that's a threat, in fact. Subaru, recognizing danger is impossible. No matter how dangerous the situation is, there's no fear. You'll accept it with delight and won't be able to correctly grasp the situation, understand? A crying, pleading child who didn't want to die had been cheered for by the masses. They found joy in everything in front of this. This was comparable to delight at being stabbed with a knife, up until your life was ended by that blade. Beatrice, the sharing of emotions, I understand, I suppose. What about sharing senses, in fact? Subaru, that's not all. When someone else feels pain, I'll feel it too. If the sin archbishop's head is cut off then mine will come flying off as well, it's overwhelming, isn't it? As he explained further, his frustration at the hopeless situation began to surface again. This explanation was rather straightforward, if she died, so would he. He'd been able to escape through return by death, but every who'd suffered before had no way of overriding that at all. Subaru, if she's alive, then there's a possibility you'll go crazy just by being nearby. If she's dead then we'll all die too. She's really the worst kind of enemy, troublesome alive or dead. On his second death, Subaru had been swallowed by fear and driven mad. The origin of that fear had been Luzbel, who desperately sought help. On that occasion, he'd continually felt Luzbel's madness as well. Their spirits had weakened, driving them into that state. It was hard to say I should have been better. It was also hard to imagine that Luzbel, who he had spoken to earlier, would resist such overwhelming terror. But something other than just fear should have killed Subaru during his second death. Finding a strategy that could defeat Sirius would be difficult without the knowledge of what that something was. Subaru didn't continue to speak, but he still kept a grip on Beatrice's hand. Obviously, he'd taken Beatrice, but he still hadn't found a solution. 
As such, Beatrice would probably be entangled in a battle with no real hope of victory. The easiest thing to do would be to have Reinhardt take Sirius alive. Subaru considered just summoning Reinhardt, like last time, and telling him to capture Sirius. He'd simply tell Reinhardt what to do before he engaged in battle. Before the sudden attack on the square, he talked to Larkins again, and Reinhardt would be called to deal with the crisis. Reinhardt wouldn't attack directly without asking for details. Even explaining the need for an emergency call, there would be at least a few minutes until Sirius would make a move. Subaru, I'm an idiot. No, I'm a moron. If Reinhardt's called then Sirius is going to react immediately. There won't be time to explain, just like last time. Subaru needed to tell Reinhardt before he started fighting Sirius. Could he do it? Subaru had no confidence that he'd be able to express his thoughts in time. In the last loop, although he'd wanted to tell Reinhardt to capture her, his mouth had disobeyed him and joined the crowd in yelling kill her. This was an undeniable precedent. Beatrice, Subaru. There's still more bad news, in fact. Subaru, seriously? I don't want to hear more bad news. Beatrice, I understand, I suppose. But, I have to tell you. Betty would be useless in a battlefield with Reinhardt, in fact. I'd just be a cute little girl, I suppose. Subaru, huh? Beatrice spoke suddenly, her eyes downcast. Beatrice, because of his physiology, Reinhardt acts as a beacon for mana. The surrounding mana in the atmosphere will follow him blindly, causing damage to the environment, which becomes a burden to him. Spirits and magic users will be unable to use mana, and I won't be able to do anything. Subaru, what the? That there should be such a thing. Even as he said so, Subaru recalled the circumstances of his arrival. On the first day Subaru had been summoned to this world, Reinhardt and Elsa had fought a battle over Amelia's royal election emblem. Subaru recalled how Amelia had mentioned how magic became ineffective as Reinhardt had revealed his true ability. Beatrice, if Reinhardt can solve the problem, then it wouldn't matter if Betty can't do anything, in fact. But, if just Reinhardt isn't enough. Subaru, Biko won't have the option of being useful. That fantasy was also killed. Just his presence would cause magic to lose all function. Calling Reinhardt would now be counterproductive. Awful, 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 what a disaster. Subaru could no longer see any light. Was it right or wrong to call Reinhardt? What about bringing Beatrice? Ignoring Sirius and trying to save people in the square. In that case, Sirius would only find another place to do the same thing. There was no point. As he contemplated, anxiety began to burn through Subaru's mind. Subaru expended as much effort as he possibly could in search of a solution, but could find none. Even so, time was ticking on mercilessly. Beatrice, Subaru, we're at the square, in fact. Subaru, hook. Hearing her, Subaru suddenly looked up and saw the square. The two had arrived at their destination, which would soon be marked by tragedy. No solution had been found yet. Their remaining time just vanished little by little. The white clock tower. The crowded square. There were less than ten minutes before the tragedy would take place. How to to solve it correctly? What to do? Beatrice, Subaru, I might have come up a solution, in fact. As Subaru's face was taut with tension, Beatrice spoke up. Subaru's blanking mind was startled by her sweet voice. Subaru, came up with a solution. Beatrice, I might be wrong, but Subaru's description of Wrath's abilities sounds familiar. I'm thinking of a higher level magic called Neck that has a similar effect. Subaru, Neck. Nekt it was a form of magic that Subaru had experienced in the past. With Nekt, magic users could share the awareness and feelings of others. Indeed, it seemed similar to Sirius's authority. While wondering why he hadn't noticed at first, Subaru thought out loud. Subaru, so is there any counter for Nekt? Beatrice, usually, countering Nekt is unnecessary, I suppose. It is intended to unite comrades and express feelings, in fact. Using Nekt as a weapon seems strange, I suppose. Beatrice gave her unhappy reply to the anxious Subaru. Subaru had once reluctantly shared his vision with Julius using Necht, in order to defeat Petalgeus by making his unseen hands visible. Necht's ability was used for cooperation between allies. It was absolutely not the kind of magic that should be used to take hostages. Beatrice, normally, there is a condition for Necht that requires contact through mana circulation, in fact. The Archbishop's authority probably has the power to circumvent such a condition, I suppose. Subaru, so her authority can forcibly achieve it. More than that. Beatrice, how to counter it, I suppose. Shamak is the most obvious answer, in fact. 
Subaru, Shamaksan has arrived. That's magnificent. Subaru perked up at Beatrice's proposal. Shamak was an incredibly familiar magic. In painful, hard, dangerous times, in the hopeless of situations, Shamak had always faced adversaries alongside Subaru. Prior to contracting Beatrice, Subaru's main sources of strength were R.E.M., Patrash, and Shamak. And even after the destruction of the Hismana Gate, through his contract with Beatrice, Shamak was still helping Subaru. Subaru, I see, Shamak, ha. Huh. If it's Shamak then surely everything is somehow. Beatrice, Subaru seems to have an unusual level of trust for Shamak, I suppose. It's the most basic of Ean magic and it's really not that useful, I suppose. Subaru, even Biko isn't allowed to badmouth Shamak like that. Beatrice, what's made Subaru defend Shamak to this extent, in fact? Beatrice listened to the incomprehensible ramblings with a sigh, then glanced around carefully while holding a finger up. Beatrice, Shamak is rooted in altering consciousness it's a magic that forcibly breaks the mind's contact with surroundings, I suppose. Subaru uses it strangely, in fact, but Betty doesn't have any problem with it at all. Subaru, in other words. Beatrice, when that magic is cast on the crowd, everyone's minds will be blinded with Shamak, and the Sin Archbishop shouldn't be a problem, in fact. Though I'm worried about whether or not I can control it from affecting Subaru, I suppose. Beatrice spoke with confidence and Subaru clenched his hands with excitement at this new glimmer of hope. Subaru, alright, good. I'll be depending on your magic. Then, what's next? Beatrice, aside from Reinhardt, who can defeat the Sin Archbishop, in fact. Subaru. If they called Reinhardt then Beatrice wouldn't be able to use her Shamak strategy. Therefore, he needed to be excluded from their calculations. However, on this occasion, Reinhardt was perhaps the only one who could defeat Sirius. Beatrice, speaking of which, since Betty needs to maintain Shamak, Betty won't be able to fight, in fact. Subaru, that's right. Then, we're back at square one. Without Beatrice's backing, Subaru would almost certainly be unable to defeat Raph. Without his trump card, just his whip alone wouldn't allow him to escape unscathed. Subaru, at that time, it seemed like there were other places to fight than the square. Subaru thought of the first time at the square. Upon detecting a threatening presence in the tower, several people reacted immediately. A beast man, a blindfolded woman, a serious-looking businessman, and Larkins. Excluding Larkins, how would the remaining three fare? Adding Subaru to their number would total four, perhaps meaning that there was yet a way out. Subaru, what a stupid train of thought, asking strangers to trust me. I don't think there's anything I haven't thought of now. In that case, should I play a part since I know of your strength? Subaru. A sudden voice from behind pierced into his hopeless thoughts. At that all too familiar voice, Subaru and Beatrice looked back in surprise. Standing behind the two with their hands on their hips. Subaru, e Emilia Tan? Why are you here? Emilia, Subaru seemed to be acting strange, so I was worried that something bad was happening. It looks like I was excluded, that's one of Subaru's bad traits. Having been criticized, Subaru pressed his mouth shut. Astonished at Emilia's sudden appearance, he couldn't respond. Beatrice took his place and looked up at Emilia. Beatrice, you should have stayed in the park, in fact. Why did you come, I suppose? Emilia, I couldn't just wait. Subaru told me to stay, but Priscilla told me otherwise. Subaru, that woman in red? Emilia, she said that if I didn't follow you, I'd certainly regret it. When I caught up and saw that nothing had happened, I thought about leaving quietly, but you two seem to be discussing something serious. Emilia's decision was influenced and the source of that evil comes to mind. Subaru gritted his teeth, mentally cursing Priscilla, and her arrogant, disruptive meddling. That malicious whimsy had perfectly arranged the situation Subaru wanted to avoid the most. Subaru, Emilia Tan, I'm happy. I'm glad, so, from now on. Emilia, the witch cult will appear. I heard you, even if Subaru tells me to go back, I won't. This concerns me too. Subaru, Emilia. There was little basis for his line of thought. He spoke sharply, desperate to drive Amelia away. She couldn't meet the witch cult. Subaru couldn't quite articulate a reason, but it wasn't anything like stubborn protectiveness. He instinctively understood that she just couldn't. Amelia absolutely couldn't meet the witch cult. To Amelia, that cult was a poison to be avoided. Although that held true for the majority of people born in this world, Amelia was a special case. Subaru, we'll manage something. Amelia doesn't need to be involved. This has nothing to do with you. Emilia, even so, what if Subaru is hurt because I'm not there? I'd never let that happen. 
If Subaru fights, I'll fight by his side. If Subaru wants to protect something, I'll do my best to help. And since Subaru will certainly protect me. Subaru. Emilia, I also want to protect Subaru. I promised I wouldn't cry like that anymore. Emilia spoke with an unyielding heart. In order to keep her away from danger, Subaru had to summon every drop of his courage, face adversity with a heart of steel. However, Subaru, right now, was afraid. He was terrified of fighting. Three times. Three times Subaru had lost to Sirius, and three times he'd lost his life. No matter how experienced he was with death, he'd still died so much, in such a short span of time. Death was horrible, unacceptable, and no matter how much he experienced it, he couldn't grow used to it. Having his life taken was completely unreasonable. That denied his self, trampled on his existence, insulted his soul. It was something that stole from him. Although he tried to cover everything up, Subaru couldn't brush off everything that affected him. Even while stubbornly maintaining that he had people he wanted to protect, he could never cast off the weak heart that was afraid to die. Natsuki Subaru, no matter what, hadn't been able to overcome that weakness. Beatrice, Subaru. You should give up, in fact. Subaru, Beatrice. Beatrice, Emilia is stubborn, I suppose. She won't change her mind, in fact. Betty also understands Emilia's feelings, I suppose. Betty wants to protect Subaru the same way. Betty isn't able to deny her that, in fact. Beatrice is key to the strategy and also the decision-making party. If she waves a white flag, then Subaru won't be unable to resist. Emilia looks to Subaru sincerely and Beatrice adorably. Under their gaze, Subaru finally gave in. Subaru, the cultists will target you. If that happens, think of yourself as a priority. Emilia, MM, I understand. Even if I'm caught, Subaru will definitely save me. I believe in you, and I'll do my best. Subaru, don't jinx it, so, how much of our conversation did you hear? Having been accepted by Subaru, Emilia gave a relaxed smile. She touched her fingers to her lips. Emilia, I heard the gist of it. The witch cult is going to wreak havoc with Necht, which Beatrice wants to counteract with Shamak. During that, I have to work hard to scold that villain. Subaru, that's a childlike way of understanding it, but it works. Emilia, can I depend on you? Emilia, leave it to me. I'm plenty strong. Emilia makes a guts pose with her hands. That lovely action showed a certain lack of tension, but she seemed to have understood. Subaru felt restless and useless about relying on Emilia. Moreover, the timing of Beatrice's magic was difficult for him to get a grasp on, which made it another element of anxiety. But... Subaru, Emilia Tan and Biko are both here, so I can't fail. Instead of feeling anxious, he used that to fuel his determination. Subaru, besides, it's almost time. Between Beatrice's proposal and Emilia's joining, more than half of their remaining time had gone by. They'd try their best when it came to Sirius. If they could, avoiding Luzbel's location and knocking the tower down would be preferable. Subaru, Emilia Tan. Soon a strange person will appear on the tower. Attack then with a big shot. Having her fall from the tower would be ideal. Afterward, Biko will prepare her spell, so when the signal comes we'll start fighting. Emilia, MM, I understand. Although I do not know if things will go that smoothly, but I'll try. Emilia's expression stiffens and both Subaru and Beatrice nod at each other. The plan is set. Subaru, she's here. A figure could be seen moving about in the clock tower's window. A body wrapped in a black coat, a head wrapped in bandages. The ends of hers chain, hanging from her hands, struck the ground with rattling sounds as she looked down at the square. The people there had yet to notice that anomalous presence. Sirius stood on her stage, shaking her body and opening her arms as though admiring the people who were unprepared for the imminent threat. And then she began to clap the people who heard the sound noticed her, and her speech began. Subaru. Swallowing, Subaru witnessed the moment. With imposing gestures, Sirius raised her chest to speak fiercely. Emilia, Ulhuma. A huge icicle appeared in front of the tower, hanging in the air near Sirius. The thick icicle, which was around the size of five people, struck the tower with a violent crash. An icicle speared through the front of the tower, and the walls split apart. Subaru's jaw dropped in amazement. Subaru, e Emilia Tan? Emilia, Subaru said we needed to strike first, so I did. Did I mess up? Subaru, no, GJ. I just didn't expect you to attack before her introduction. Subaru hadn't motioned for her to act yet, and was surprised that Emilia had spotted the threat at a glance. Since Sirius had been equally unprepared. Maybe the blow had even taken her out. 
Moreover, the panicked crowd were all fine, so perhaps Sirius had indeed been incapacitated. That was entirely from Amelia's great contribution. Subaru, Biko, what do you think? Beatrice, first of all, think of a way to address the misunderstanding people around us, in fact. As Beatrice's surprise turned to pride, Subaru wanted to ask whether or not they'd gotten serious. Amelia surveyed the destruction of the tower, while Subaru slowly turned to face the uneasy crowd. The beast man and the blindfolded woman were there how unfortunate, they were people that Subaru had wanted to ally with. Subaru, uh, well, what do I do now? Explain that we didn't mean any harm? Amelia, mm. You better do that, Subaru. While Subaru scratched his head, pondering the explanation, Amelia suddenly grabbed his shoulders, placing herself in front of the crowd. In that moment, a crack sounded through the air, and a blue sword of ice appeared in Amelia's hands. She assumed a battle-ready posture, facing down the crowd. Subaru, Amelia Tan? You don't have to go that far. Amelia, it's not that. Look closely, Subaru. There's no sign of sanity. Subaru? Scared by Amelia's suddenly firm voice, Subaru surveyed the crowd around them, and couldn't help but exclaim. Like Amelia had said, their eyes held no trace of cognizance. The people around them were red from neck up, the blood vessels in their faces on the verge of bursting, bloodshot eyes glaring at Subaru's group. Their gazes were filled with only fury. Subaru, Biko. What about Shamak? Beatrice. It failed, I suppose. Subaru, what? Beatrice, this magic is nothing like Necht, no, it's evil, in fact. This is nothing like magic, I suppose. A curse, it is magic, in fact. Beatrice raised her voice in anger, and Subaru could only answer with a frown. He wasn't sure of the specifics, but Beatrice's shamak hadn't worked. He understood the issue, but had no solution. Then, the masses were completely engulfed by madness. Crowd, it stinks. It stinks. It stinks. It stinks. It stinks. It stinks. Stinks, 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 stinks. It was a terrible, viscous sound that was cursing the world. With the sound of a detonation, the clock tower collapsed. The remainder of the tower cracked apart, decimating the rest of it, and the icicles embedded in the tower shattered to pieces. Shimmering, the ice crystallized in the sun, accompanied by the faint sound of footsteps. The footsteps of an abomination. She wasn't unhurt. Half of the bandages wrapped around her face were stained with blood, which also dripped from her left arm and her chain. Amelia's premeditated attack had no doubt played an effect. Only, it had also caused something undesirable. Serious, disgusting, the stench of that woman, filthy and detestable, the stench of the one who stole my husband from me, the stench of maggots, endless filth. Hate, I hate it so much, burning it to cinders isn't enough. Subaru, what are you saying? Sirius, and that other woman, she's obviously not that person, but she has such a similar stench, how shameless, the stench of rotting insects, ah 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 a a a a a a a h. How hateful. How rancid. How vile. The anomalous woman clutched her bleeding head with a harsh cry. Spittle flew from her mouth as she ruthlessly stomped her feet. Subaru knew this odd behavior. It was wild as ever, but its direction was obviously different. Sirius, my. Are you testing the love for my husband, spirit? Were you not satisfied with taking my husband from me, you half-half-witch bitch? Gritting her teeth, she issued a wrathful cry as she leapt forward. Sirius, who'd fallen from the tower, folded her arms in front of her face, and red flames flared into life. They sprayed from both arms, and a line of flame had formed as she landed in the square. Exercising her limbs, armed with her flame, the madwoman raised her head. Amelia held her sword of ice ready as she stood in front of Subaru and Beatrice, guarding them. Swinging her gaze back and forth, Sirius yelled with a furious voice. Sirius, I am the witch cult sin archbishop of wrath. Red flames gushing forth, she bathed the crowd in heat as she raised her arms. In a frenzied crisis completely different from the situation Subaru had expected, the madwoman introduced herself. Sirius, Sirius Romani Conti. Damn half-elf and spirit, I'll scorch your corpses and scatter your ashes at my husband's tomb. End of chapters 22-23, A Casual Response